and welcome to this session of Maritime Medicine in which we discuss musculoskeletal injuries and in particular dislocations. By the end of this session you'll be able to define a dislocation in the context of a musculoskeletal joint, perform the assessment of a dislocated joint, and reduce the following dislocations, a shoulder, a finger, a patella, a hip prosthesis, and a native hip. We also cover quite a bit of dislocation reduction in the fracture dislocation lecture. So elbows, knees, wrists, those are covered there as well, and the same techniques would apply. You won't know if it's a fracture dislocation or not because you don't have an x-ray, so you would use the same techniques regardless of whether it was a fracture and a dislocation or just a dislocation. So what is a dislocation. Basically, it's disruption of the joint as an articular surface. And what does that mean? Well, joints work by bringing two bones together. And the bones move relative to each other over that joint. And so, if you move one bone relative to another, the joint doesn't work anymore. And that's called loss of articulation and it, you lose mechanical function because those parts aren't together anymore. Well they don't normally move apart because they're held in place by ligaments and then the muscles with their tendinous attachments also serve to stabilize the big joints and so you typically need to either ligament, injure the ligaments or li injure the tendons to have the joint articulation disrupted. Sometimes you even have to break bones and because you've got nerves and you've got blood vessels around those areas, you can injure those as well. And we look at joints as either being partially pulled apart, what's called a subluxation, where part of the articular surfaces are still in contact with each other, or a complete dislocation. And this can happen with any joint, although some are more prone to this than others, in particular the shoulder dislocates and it can either pop out down or up. The patella or your kneecap, the finger, and hip prostheses or artificial hips are notorious. Uh, the cups and the balls are often made by different manufacturers. They have a wide range of tolerances and depending on how they're put in, uh, sometimes these things just pop out repeatedly. Less common dislocations are the native hip, that is, somebody's own hip that hasn't been replaced. Now, it can happen. They can be dislocated, um, but typically they're going to be associated with a fracture because that's an incredibly stable joint, and to simply pull the hip out is unusual. You usually have to break part of the acetabulum, the, the part of the pelvis where the ball goes into, so that that ball slides out from the socket there. The knee can be dislocated. A knee dislocation is different than a patellar dislocation, and we'll talk about why, but it relates to the anatomy of those two structures. The patella is just this free-floating chunk of bone that's attached by a tendon above and a tendon below and just basically keeps the tendon from your quadriceps from rubbing directly on the bones of the knee, the femur and the, the tibia, uh, particularly. That's all the patella does. It's almost like a thickening, a bony thickening in the center of the tendon that just makes that hinge work better. The knee itself is the whole joint uh, where the, the femur comes down and connects to the tibia and to a minimal degree to the fibula and so that disruption is an entirely different disruption than the patellar dislocation and the elbow can also be dislocated. Again, it's not overly common but it can happen. So when you're assessing you're going to do all the things you learned how to do in the assessment session. But in particular, you're looking for deformity of the joint. And you've always got comparisons. You've got the patient's own side-to-side -side comparisons, and you've got your own joints to be able to look at to determine what looks normal and what doesn't. But to be dislocated, that joint can't be together anymore. So it's, it's got to look different. You're going to have a loss of function and movement. This can happen with a fracture as well, but when that joint is apart, it won't function the way it used to. Now, it may still function. If I pop my shoulder out, my biceps can still contract and 
I can stabilize the shoulder with that and then I can use my deltoid to lift the shoulder to a certain degree. It'll be very uncomfortable typically, especially if I haven't dislocated my shoulders in the past and I don't have problems with the joints from lots of prior dislocations, but still there may be some movement. Uh, the same with a finger dislocation. You dislocate the joints in the finger. You may be able to twitch it a little bit, but it's not going to bend the way that it used to. So you need to check function and movement, and then you need to, to check, again, circulation, motor function, and sensation distally. And that's for all dislocations. Now, joint specifically, when you dislocate the shoulder, you can injure what's known as your axillary nerve. And that's the nerve that gives sensation to the lateral proximal humerus. So if you think about where a patch would be sewn on the sleeve of a uniform shirt, right up by the shoulder, that's the area that you lose sensation in. And so if you injure the axillary nerve, you get what's called patch anesthesia. So you need to assess that area. In the knee, if the tibia dislocates posteriorly to the femur, there's a very high incidence of injury to the arteries behind there. And what happens is the wall of the artery splits apart. You get dissection, you get clots that form there, and you can lose blood flow to the lower leg. So any posterior knee dislocation is very concerning. And particularly if they're, it's dislocated and you manage to reduce it, you need to make sure somebody knows that it was backwards uh, because that person needs to get a test called an angiogram or some other study to make sure blood is still flowing through the artery and there's no injury to the artery wall. The ideal thing, as always in any patient that has an injury, is take the patient's own phone, take a picture of the injury, send the phone with the patient, make sure that whoever accepts the patient knows that there's a picture of the injury on the phone. Now the hip is sort of this very interesting vascular structure. The the head of the hip, or the, the very end of that ball where it goes into the cup, actually gets a lot of its blood supply from the cup. The blood vessels traverse that joint. And so when you pull that hip out, you can injure those blood vessels. And if it doesn't go back in quickly, it's not reduced quickly, you can end up basically cutting off the blood supply to the, the end of the bone there to that the, the ball and that ball can die in necrosis it's called avascular necrosis and that's a big long-term problem for your patient. So here's a shoulder dislocation and in this case we're looking at the patient from the front and so it is the patient's uh, you can see that the patient's left shoulder is dislocated you look at the right shoulder, that's a normal appearing shoulder. It goes straight out and then turns down the arm. You look at his left shoulder and you can see there's a divot where the shoulder should be. And so that's your physical exam finding. On that lower picture, you see that circle. That's where the axillary nerve gives you sensation. So that's where you get patch anesthesia. And that picture on the top is the picture of the, sh the head of the humerus there actually dislocated from the joint. So how do you put the shoulder back in? Well, there is a link to the shoulderdislocation.net webpage, and there are so many techniques. It's ridiculous, and every technique has its own variant, uh, but none's been proven better than the other. Uh, although, I will say that from your perspective, where you can't do procedural sedation, that is, you can't give the patient medications to completely knock them out the way we would in the emergency department, you're going to want a procedure that depends more on you being patient and slowly fatiguing the muscle as opposed to giving them drugs to completely fa basically turn off and, and make their muscles sleep and get rid of the spasm and then pop it in. So you need techniques that are based more on patience. And there is a handout, the painless shoulder reduction technique handout, that it's well worth keeping that for the rest of your careers. So you're trying not to use brute force and you may need to use some medications not for procedural sedation you're not knocking them out but giving them pain medications will go a long way to making them more comfortable and making the reduction easier uh, three techniques that I've used that generally don't require medications if you're very patient are the modified milch technique Stimson's technique and scapular manipulation
So in the modified Milch technique, you AD dot. These, this is for an inferior dislocation. Uh, superior are, are much trickier, and you have to look up those techniques separately. But inferior very is the most common way. So you adduct or adduct the arm to the patient's side. So you're basically putting their elbow on their side, and you flex the elbow to 90 degrees. And so if you think about it, it's as if their elbow was glued to the side of their stomach and their hand was out like they were going to shake your hand. You then put your hand on the palm of their hand and use your other hand to hold the elbow against their side, the patient's elbow against their side, and you let the weight of your hand slowly rotate their arm out. And you're going to rotate it out to about 90 degrees. You're not pushing down, you're just using the weight of your hand to fatigue their muscles and spasm. When it gets to 90 degrees, it will often reduce on its own. And so, boom, falls in. If it doesn't, you then essentially pull that hand. That arm is now rotated to 90 degrees. So you pull the arm and the hand out. And so you are abducting the arm. It's in the coronal plane of the body, so straight up and down. So you're bringing the shoulder out to 90 degrees. The humeral head is lifted into the socket, and you can actually feel in the armpit, find the humeral head, and sort of push on it to help incentivize it to fall back into the socket. It's not brute force. It's some very gentle manipulation. You can continue to lift above 90 degrees until you bring their arm over their head in the position that they would be in if they were reaching up overhead to pick an apple. And at that point, the shoulder typically will have reduced. It, I find that 80 to 90 percent of mine reduced just with the external rotation, and then all but one to two percent reduced by lifting the arm over the head. And oftentimes, when I bring it back down to start again, if it hadn't worked the first time, that's when it falls in. Stimson's technique is great because you don't need anybody else to help you. You allow the patient to lay prone on an elevated table of some sort, examining stretcher, what have you, and the injured arm is hanging over the edge. So they're laying so that their injured arm is just barely over the edge and hanging straight down. You then attach a 7 to 12 kilogram weight to their arm at about the level of the wrist and you use a wide attachment. You can use a wide ace wrap and make a hitch or an inch and a half strap. You don't want it cutting into the wrist. You want it to basically hang there. And it needs to be far enough so it's hanging maybe six to eight inches off of the ground. And then you just let it hang. You can't have the patient hold on to it. Their hand muscles will fatigue before their shoulder muscles. It's got to be attached to them. And you let it hang. And eventually, 20 minutes, half an hour, it's going to reduce. You may find that it goes in a little faster if you give them, say, 5 milligrams of IV morphine beforehand or IM morphine, but it will go in on its own eventually. And then you can also do something called scapular manipulation, and this works really well if you've got someone hanging weight and you're doing Stimson's technique, you can do this, or you can have them seated upright. And basically, you take the humerus, you externally rotate the arm and you hold it in that position and you may need somebody to hold it for you that's that's very helpful to do that and as the arm becomes fatigued and relaxes you push the inferior tip of the scapula the shoulder blade medially so you're pushing that towards the spine at the same time that you're reaching up and almost pulling the superior scapula laterally and that opens up the shoulder joint and the glenohumeral joint, and boom, the humerus falls right back in. It's a wonderful thing. After you've reduced it, reassess distal circulation, motor function, sensory function, and check for patchy anesthesia because you can pinch the nerve, the axillary nerve, during the reduction. Put them in a sling and swath. They'll probably need some pain control, maybe even an oral narcotic for the first day or so for pain. And depending on how much pain they're in and whether or not you think there's also a fracture and whether or not they're functional or not, you may need to evacuate them. Otherwise, when you get to the next port, they need an x-ray of the shoulder and they need to arrange follow-up.
Patella dislocations, again, are not knee dislocations. It's your kneecap sliding off to the side. So basically, your kneecap is attached from this, the quadriceps to the patella with a super patellar tendon, and that basically widens out, completely surrounds the kneecap, and then goes inferiorly and attaches to the tibia with the infrapatellar tendon. It's really just one long tendon with a big lump of bone in the middle, but we call it two just for the sake of description. And it slides in this groove between uh, what are essentially knuckles over the end of the femur uh, and kind of slides in that, and it can slip out to the sides. So what happens is the knee gets hyperextended. We see this a lot in gymnastics, but it can happen if you slip and you suddenly hyperextend your knee. The patella almost free floats in space. It's got a V on the bottom of it to try to keep it in that patellar groove, but if it lifts up high enough, any torsion on it at all will cause it to dislocate off to the side. So here's a patient with a patellar dislocation. Looking at it straight on, you can see how it's dislocated the, to the patient's left, and then when you look at the side, you can basically see it just sitting there off the knee. The knee joint itself is completely intact. You haven't disrupted the ligaments of the knee joint at all. This is just the patella that slid off to the side. So how do you reduce a patellar dislocation? Well, what people who dislocate their patellas a lot are trained to do is to extend their leg, basically to straighten it. And if you can help them to do that, oftentimes it'll pop right in. Sometimes they're very anxious or there's too much pain, and so that technique doesn't work. One thing that you can do, if you have a bed, a stretcher that can be lowered, if you can bring it up to the right height so that with their leg extended and their heel just over the end of the bed, you can cup their heel with your hand and you just let it hang by your side, you're cupping their heel and then you have someone else slowly lower the bed, that will very slowly straighten out the leg and extend the knee and the patella will pop back in. Sometimes you give them a little pain medicine to help it, but it's not always necessary. If that doesn't work, have someone else try to extend it, and then you can pull the inner edge of the patella away from the, the leg slightly, like you see in the upper picture, and then apply some pressure to the outer edge, and it'll just pop right into place. Sometimes you have to wiggle it a little bit, but it usually falls right in. After you've reduced it, do your circulation, motor and sensory evaluation. They shouldn't be able to injure any blood vessels or nerves with this. So make sure that you're not finding something else weird is going on. If they have distal neurovascular problems, then you're not fixing the problem. The, the dislocated kneecap was not the only problem. Then you need to put them into a knee immobilizer, either a commercial one if you happen to have them available to you. Sometimes they're stocked. If you don't, you make a custom-made one where basically you make a medial and a lateral rigid support, and this is covered in the splinting handouts um, where you basically put a splint on either side of the knee and then put a supporting bandage like an ace wrap or cling gauze or something around to support that. For finger dislocations, basically you're dislocating across those interphalangeal joints, the, the knuckles essentially between your sections of your fingers and in, in all your fingers except for your thumb you've got two of those interphalangeal joints and then down by your hand the, your your true knuckles you have uh, you have that's actually your metacarpal phalangeal joints uh, those don't typically dislocate if they do that's a lot of force that's different than what we're talking about we're talking about those tiny little joints that are between the sections of your fingers your thumb has one interphalangeal joint so you can either dislocate the end superior or inferior relative to the proximal part. Usually there'll be a tiny fracture with this, not necessarily. Oftentimes if it's a fracture, it's an avulsion fracture where the ligament actually tears out a chunk of bone so it's no longer attached. And theoretically you can get a neurovascular injury as well, although it's unlikely it can happen. Uh, it's just it's small structures there. So the management you may or may or not need to give them some kind of analgesia and actually if they they're so anxious and they're in so much pain that you need to the best analgesia is to do a digital block uh, so inject a little bit of lidocaine proximally right past the metacarpal phalangeal joint to numb up the fingers and that technique is described elsewhere 
and then you need to unhook the join edges so you need to rotate the edges apart relative to each other um, if you think of them as basically the flared bells of two trumpets end to end one slid on top of the other you can see I'd have to lift it up a little bit to unlock them and then apply some distal traction and they'll come apart sometimes they can be a real pain uh, to do and then you definitely need to do analgesia but usually you can walk over to the patient and say, oh, wow, looks like you dislocated your finger. I'm just, I'm just going to take a look. This won't hurt. You take a look, and then you just push up and pull out, and it pops right into place. You splint it, either buddy tape it to the finger next to it, or use a finger splint, and then re reassess your distal uh, circulation, motor, and sensory function. So artificial hips do dislocate. They're made up of a cup and a ball so if you look at the picture immediately below the text you see the cup that's in the pelvis and the ball that goes down into the shaft into the femur and then look directly to the the right of that and you can see how that ball has popped out of the cup that's a dislocation looking at the picture on the top that is a fracture of the prosthesis and you're not really going to be able to distinguish between that and a dislocation. You, they'll look the same, the patient will have discomfort, and you won't be able to reduce it, and you'll evacuate them, and they'll get an x-ray, and voila, that's what they'll see. So typically, what are your findings? You'll have shortening and rotation of the affected limb. So the limb will typically be turned inward or outward, depending on how it dislocated and it'll be shorter than the other limb. So there's lots of different ways of doing this. Um, and none is the best, although I'm coming to really like the Captain Morgan technique and we'll talk about that. So one is anterior superior traction with pelvis counter traction. So that's basically where you are having somebody hold the pelvis down and you're standing on the bed and you are pulling up on the leg and trying to rotate it back and forth so that that ball pops in. The second is what you see in this picture, and that's long axis, long axis traction. So he's pulling away, and then someone else is keeping the patient from sliding down the bed. That's actually what that sheet across the chest is for, is somebody's anchoring from the head. And then someone else is manipulating the hip joint to try to pop things in. And then the third is the Captain Morgan technique. And if you think about Captain Morgan on his bottle of rum with his foot up. So one foot is up and the foot is flat on the bed. And then you take the affected leg and you bring the hip to 90 degrees. You flex it to 90 degrees. And it should be easy to flex. There's going to be muscle spasm, but it's not in the joint. And then you flex the knee to 90 degrees across your knee. So basically, you're now pressing your tibia against the back of their thigh. Their knee is bending over top of your knee. And their butt is on the bed. And then, either with someone holding down on the pelvis or not, you lift up your knee like you're standing up on tiptoe while at the same time you are holding their ankle on the affected leg with your with your hand on the same side so suppose the patient had a dislocated right hip you would put your right foot right behind their buttock you would put their right knee over top of your right knee and you would hold on to their right ankle with your right hand to keep it from just the knee from extending and then you would essentially stand up tiptoe with your right foot your left foot's planted firmly on the ground your right foot goes up in tiptoe and you may even need to gently push down leverage against their ankle right ankle with your right hand and rotate side to side and that often pops it right back in. Once you've reduced it you put them into a knee immobilizer because it's really the flexion of the knee that allows them to really move the hip around. 
So immobilize the knee, put them into crutches. Um, and if their symptoms are completely resolved, it's a follow-up of the next port for x-ray and care. If you haven't resolved their symptoms, you're probably going to need to evacuate them. Now, native hip dislocations, again, are very rare without a fracture. And you're not going to be able to distinguish a fracture dislocation from a simple dislocation. And frankly, you're really going to have a hard time distinguishing these from just a hip fracture where there's a break through the neck of the femur. So you look at the picture of the femur, the upper x-ray, the femur comes up from the bottom and then it makes about a 45 degree turn to the ball, which is in the cup there. That neck there will often break. And so you, without an x-ray, are probably not going to be able to tell whether there's a break there whether it's a dislocated hip, like if you look on the other side of that pelvis, that hip is out on the left, or if you look at the lower x-ray, that hip is out as well, and whether that's a simple dislocation or fractured dislocation. So if you've got someone that you think has dislocated their hip, you've now reduced that blood flow to the head of the femur, to that ball, that's an emergency to get that back in but you don't exactly know what's going on. So you use the same techniques, except that you're going to need help. You need a nearby ship with a doctor, preferably a cruise ship that actually has the ability to do x-rays to be able to distinguish what's going on, and the patient will need to be sedated. And if somebody dislocates a native hip, they need to be evacuated no matter what. So if they pop out their hip, even if you reduce it and they're feeling better, they need to be evacuated because they probably have a fracture with it and they may have other injuries that need to be assessed. So treat it like a femur fracture. You don't need a traction splint. You can use the knee immobilizer but, or the equivalent, whatever you can build with the supplies you have, but they need to be evacuated. Please complete any associated knowledge assessments and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact either your professor or your instructor. Thank you very much.